Dear participants, thank you very much for staying with us. So we are just heading to start second session of our today's webinar on student satisfaction and quality of higher education. In today's session, we have speakers from home and abroad. I feel their scholarly contributions will enrich this session, extend the horizon of knowledge, and help us to better understand what should be the face of education today and tomorrow. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any question during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box. Our reporters will collect questions from the Q&A box and will facilitate the session chairs. To keep the quality of sound functional during this discussion, please mute yourself. So we are just on time, so let's start. I would like to welcome our first keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Chui Wing Hong Eric, Dean of Students, Office of the Vice President, Student Affairs, City University of Hong Kong, Hong Kong. He is from the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences. He is presenting on nurturing young minds with holistic university education. And this session will be chaired by Professor Dr. A.F.M. Saiful Amin. He is from the Department of Civil Engineering, Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology, Bangladesh. So. I would like to request Professor Dr. A.F.M. Saiful Amin to take over the session, sir. So I'm requesting uh, the Professor Dr. A.F.M. Saiful Amin to take over the session, please, sir. Yes, we are here together and it's a great day that uh, we have with us uh, our Professor uh, Eric Chui from Dean of Students from the City University of Hong Kong. So we'll be hearing from him about his vast experience in the field of education, and also the student's satisfaction and how it's defined and how it's uh, qualified, quantified and how we can improve it. Because the student satisfaction is the major part governing uh, in our uh, education and it is very, very important for our educators as well. So can we invite uh, uh, Professor Chui to kindly uh, deliver the speech? Professor Chui is here with us connected. You are there. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor. And um, uh, may I, first of all, uh, would like to thank the organizers of um, East West University for inviting me to share the experience uh, of Hong Kong in relation to the two topic areas, st student satisfaction, as well as quality of education. 
And um, so once again, uh, um, I'm very, very honored um, to give a short presentation about um, the um, experience at the case of um, um, you know, at Hong Kong. How do we define um, student satisfaction and what quality of education it can be? Um, so um, while um, I'm not able physically um, in Bangladesh, I know that I've heard so many, many beautiful things about Bangladesh and I wish at some point in my life, I have a chance to visit um, your beautiful country. Otherwise, I will just um, share, you know, um, the PPT first with you and I'll kick off with my presentation. So I hope you can hear my English well because English is not my mother tongue. In fact, um, uh, Putonghua and Cantonese are my um, mother tongue. Um, uh, so uh, please bear with me with my uh, Hong Kong accent. Okay, I hope uh, all of you will be able to share, uh, look at uh, the PowerPoints I've prepared to you. I will go walk through with you in the coming 30 minutes. And then I understand uh, we'll, I will have about 10 minutes for question and answer. Okay, so today the topic is about nurturing young minds with holistic education, university education. And let me introduce to you very briefly, I'm the Dean of the Students at the university and my university would have about 16,000 students, ranging from undergraduate students to PhD students, doctoral students, and about 4,000 um, academic staff. So, which is about 20,000. It's a very small campus, but uh, we have to cater the needs of um, students from all walks of life and um, ranging from 17 to people who are um, in 60s when they are still you know, completing their university education. So, uh, but my, the other role is I'm the professor in uh, social work and criminology at City University, but I am seconded to look after almost uh, all the students um, at City University of Hong Kong. Okay, how am I going to present or what are the topics I'm going to talk about? You can see, I will focus very much on the keywords, quality of education, student satisfaction. And I will share with you about the, how the Hong Kong landscape is, how do we define how important these two concepts in the university education sector in Hong Kong. And then I will, if time allows, I will share a little bit with you about this how CTU, my university, is doing to promote or to enhance student satisfaction throughout the journey in the in their university education. Let me kick off with the first one, quality of education. I'm sure uh, if uh, I have a chance, I will, I will definitely ask you to think about what it refers to. Based on a wide range of literature, you can see that this concept, in fact, is quite contested. If you are from the perspective of the students, probably from this list, you will focus very much on maybe the employment, uh, the graduate outcome, right? So in order to make sure that we understand this is the quality education, while wow, my graduates will go to top-notch university uh, after graduation, they will go to the uh, uh, investment banker, you know, the top-notch law firms and things like that. But if you are from the senior management these days now, especially in Hong Kong, because we want to make sure our university is a global university, which is able to nurture not only the students locally, but also from other all parts of the world. And um, surely, probably we will look at international ranking, right? Because this is one way to um, make sure that we are on the spotlight and people will know or will have heard about the name, right? We make an impact on in terms of the international ranking. How to boost up the international ranking? At the moment, we focus very much on research. I'm sure we all know about the QS ranking. So we are all very keen to move up the ladder. And that's the reason why, you know, you, you can see from this list, there is a contested concept. 
But from the employer's point of view, the other stakeholder about education, probably we want our graduates, they are having technical skills and they have the skills ready for employment. So instead of giving them a lot of times for orientation, induction, they have to do the job right away. I'm sure I don't need to elaborate further on that about different stakeholders may have different um, sort of emphasis. Okay, let me give you a few more contested uh, uh, um, uh, con concepts about what education is about. Obviously, there are a, a, a number of aspects that we have to look into. I'm sure no matter whether you are in, let's say in China or Hong Kong, we try to quantify everything, right? And uh, as always, you know, uh, if we talk about quality education, I think my university produces quality students, but what does it mean? But that, that's the reason why we have to quantify them. As in this quotation, you can see that people quantify that into student staff ratio, number of hours on internships, the money that we, spend on our facilities for research, education, staff, etc. I don't think I need to elaborate because somehow as the key management of the senior, man, senior management, quality education means, you know, we are going to maximize everything in order to produce very good outcome. However, um, when I read some of the literature, and there is a counter argument for that, as shown in this slide on the second, par uh, uh, second paragraph. They just say that the increasing quantity of measurable characteristics does not automatically lead to high quality. I'm sure, ask yourself, uh, when I started the job as a lecturer back in year 2000, which is about 21 years ago, I remember the KPI, the key, for, 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 the key performance indicator of a department or a, de, or a university Probably, We just have a few KPIs, but now we have, a, we have a long list. So somehow we are catching up all the time. So there are pros and cons associated with that. But surely I just want to draw your attention to a rather old fashioned quotation here. Um, in this um, a, a, a quotation here, it shows that now while some people or educators or the managers of the university, they will see our students as customers, consumers, that no wonder we have so many surveys and, and um, we look into the views of our students and things like that. But ultimate goal here, we have never changed, is about Education is about the ongoing process of transformation of the student. We see them as a participant and we see that it's an ongoing process of transformation. And um, so I don't think we can get away from that despite the fact that we have a long list of um, indicators of quality education. So we, will, uh, we are going to have more and more, I'm sure. But, but without, with, with that, I just want to draw the attention that students are still important in a way that ultimately we want them to see the transformation of the students. And this transformation relates to the student satisfaction and I will convene to you later on. Okay, to summarize, um, in Hong Kong, let's say from the teacher's perspective or from the professor's perspective, quality education, maybe it's only part of the total sum of our work because we have to do research, publish a lot, make an impact in the society. At the same time, we have to serve the community. So in fact, before this keynote speech, I, I would love to join you much earlier, but I was in another uh, local conference uh, on um, student volunteering. And uh, that's the reason why you know, I, just, I was just able to join about 20 minutes ago because a, a part of uh, my job not only about teaching research, but also about linking to the community. But for the students, when we talk about holistic universication, 
Today, I try to simplify that into two major categories. And these two are in fact highly related to the level of student satisfaction. The first one is about experience inside the classroom. I think during the break, and I can see the beautiful video that you have prepared for um, uh, from East West University. So I can see a lot of smiling faces in the classroom. So lecturing and with the whiteboard and um, uh, a lot of um, students uh, taking notes and things like that. But also uh, because of my role as a Dean of Students, I have to look after the experience outside classroom as, as well. And this is the so-called the total sum of the student experience um, uh, in, my, in my mind. Let me continue with that about student satisfaction. Um, as always, you know, it is important to see what, it, what is it about when we talk about student satisfaction. Can we ask simple a question about, are you satisfied with your degree or your university? In fact, we can go beyond that. When we talk about satisfaction, that can be in relation to two major aspects. One aspect, in fact, is about outcomes. The other one is the experience. Let me explain to you what is meant by outcomes. For the outcomes, we we'll definitely look at the employability of our students. Okay, I'm sure all the parents send their kids to the university. They are with the hope of them getting a stable, somehow well-paid jobs, and also a highly respected um, career or escalation of the career with time. But on the other hand, another sort of outcomes that we are interested in will be the personal and professional growth. As I've mentioned to you about the word transformation. So again, the key word is on personal and professional growth. How to measure that? And I will show you later on. Um, this slides really capture the, um, the sort of work that, which is different from what I've presented to you about employability or classroom learning. As you can see from here, uh, we are interested in learning or the experience, not just within the classroom, but outside the classroom. So in the cartoon, you can see that we have academic advising. We are interested in the support services. Like for example, we have a group of staff looking at promoting career and leadership skills. So leadership may not be a major topic area, let's say in the engineering degree, but we feel that these are important. We have to support them. We have to provide them with opportunities to promote their leadership, no matter it is a servant leadership or it's simply about leading discussions to be a professional leader later on in teams, very instrumental, but we still want students, they take it outside the classroom. On the other hand, we have financial support services. Um, I, I'm sure we, we all feel that no one should be discriminated against because of their um, socioeconomic backgrounds. If they have the merits to join the university, I think as a university, we have to make sure we facilitate these people in need in order to um, complete their degree throughout the journey and to be successful, because this is one way for the um, young people to climb up the social ladder. On the other hand, we have campus life, including our halls of residence, and uh, we emphasize very much on our hall life. And in Hong Kong, we are aiming at um, achieving at least within the four year undergraduate studies, at least they have one whole full year living in the halls so that they will be able to communicate with um, other peer group outside the classroom and they love each other and they hate each other throughout the year and they, they grow together. I think that is the most important, but of course with proper guidance uh, from our staff. 
And on your right hand side, you can see that we emphasis on the campus safety. We can emphasis on the um, nourishing environment. We make sure that we have enough co-working space for the students to mingle around, make sure our canteen. So that's the reason why I put on so many hats and even the canteen, I, I have to feed them well too. I'm sure this is important um, to have a, a very nice meal and then they can um, go back to the lecture theater and things like that. All right, so student satisfaction go beyond classroom. I hope by now I can convince you. And think not because that I love outside learning a, a classroom, and um, but also as the head, uh, as the, um, the dean of the students in the university. So I have the responsibility to make sure even outside classroom, there are enough opportunities for them to grow personally and also professionally. And these are some of the examples. I, will, I just want to share some photos with you. I'm sure it will be much more the same. We have the lab, language enhancement courses, and we have a lot of learning commons. Then these are the formal learning experience. And these are the informal one. For example, we have the sports and arts facilities. And each year we uh, provide students with experiences in learning how to perform in musical, orchestra, net, you name it, Chinese orchestra. Even for the international students, they are allowed to uh, organize their own music activities uh, uh, at some point because with our, with our global engagement office. And we have the internship experience, we have the study abroad experience, hostel education, experiential learning, and the students have to go out to, to reach out to the deprived groups um, um, in order to demonstrate the leadership and the servant leadership, etc. These are all the examples that I would love to share with you about what informal education is about. And all this also would help to promote our students' satisfaction. Okay, the reason why I say this, uh, why it is important to have so-called informal education or we call it as co-curricular activities. And I'm sure um, in, the, um, in your seminar, you have a lot how to make sure you get pro 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 um, there are quality assurance mechanism to improve the teaching and learning in the classroom. But today, uh, as I've mentioned, because of the, in, in the interest of time, I focus very much on the co-curriculum activities. Um, as I've mentioned to you, they are equally important to complement or to supplement the, um, um, the uh, to help students to achieve personal and intellectual growth. Um, evidence is enough to show that um, if students who are more involved outside classroom, in the campus life, outside classroom, they are more likely to be positive members of the university community. And they are usually the most satisfied groups. And third, in the long run, we are interested in donation. I'm sure um, most of the high education these days now Nowadays, we have an alumni office or development office to make sure that we maintain good network with our alumni. But at the same time, we want to promote the loyalty, the sense of belonging, so that they would help out with the development of the university. And as um, the economic situation in every society, we rely on the philanthropy of our alumni, especially no matter they are successful or not. And um, so what about co-curriculum? So in my university, we are very focused on the, the skills, uh, the outcomes, as, as mentioned to you about personal and emotion, professional skills. And we rely very much on the OECD future skills for the university, for young people. I'm sure some of you may have heard that they have um, that sort of 10 core future skills and namely collaborative problem solving. And none of them, in fact, refer to the classroom technical knowledge. I'm sure so if you have a chance to look at the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and they have already published quite a number of publications in order to look at how in the future, in the long run, what are needed, what sort of skills needed 
from our young people. And as you can see that empathy, respect for others are very crucial. And think about if you are doing a engineering or mathematics degree, do you think they, the, in, during the classroom, uh, the, the professors will be able to teach them this sort of soft skills? And that's the reason why uh, we, um, as a dean of students, my office will be able to complement some of the skills uh, that has not been covered or they touch on that very briefly. And uh, we further drill on that. And these are the emphasis of my office because we look at very, uh, uh, we pay a lot of emphasis on the, the important skills. Um, just give you some example about how, what sort of skills uh, that we talk about. You can see that when we are involved in sports, music, leadership skills, teamwork, communication, even how to promote um, your activities and attract fellow classmates or students to join them. And all these are important to the employability in the future, because nowadays in your portfolio, if you don't have these sort of skills, I think you will be, you will be very disadvantaged um, when you, uh, people look at the CV because there are a lot of university graduates and how can you make yourself distinguish and distinctive from others. And surely uh, I believe that co-curriculum or the informal education is so important. And um, uh, uh, I don't want to, uh, to need to elaborate. And there is a kind of consensus that there is a positive um, correlation between the participation in co-curricular activities and also the future employability from graduates perspective employees perspective. And this is the book um, I borrow from the, the title of the book is about high education in the globalizing world. So you can see that it's not just about um, a Hong Kong experience, but in other parts of the world, they see things as the same as. Okay, let me go through to move on to the third part, which is the student satisfaction in Hong Kong. So I would look into that a little bit more. And um, I'm sure um, every country or every state or, or every um, particular area, they emphasize very much on quality assurance and student satisfaction surely is one of the indicators uh, to measure how good your university um, uh, or, or to demonstrate how good your university is. In Hong Kong, um, the government, because city university is one of the eight um, government funded universities. We have a lot of private universities. I think if I, uh, I, if I read correctly, I think East West University is one of the private ones. So, uh, uh, but in Hong Kong, we have about eight and then about maybe another five to six private uh, universities or colleges. And, but within these eight universities, we ha have to sign a so-called a university accountability agreement. We call UAA. In fact, we just have finished our triennium. Um, um, we are preparing for the 2022 to 2025. And this is one way for them, uh, for a governing body really to look at the various aspects of our education to see whether we fulfill or meet the expectations of um, the society. And uh, um, in the UAA, there are four major indicators. And as always, you can see that um, they are very, there are a lot of indicators. And I just picked up a few to showcase to you how we are measuring it. So number one, you can see that the, is to look at the satisfaction with the quality and the value which they gain from the experience. Number two, Satisfaction with the overall learning environment. Number three, undergraduate employment success rate. And the first three, it will be conducted annually by each of these HUGC institutions. So every year I am part of the team really to conduct a, um, a, 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 a survey among our students and usually it will be the final year students. So before their graduation, so we will ask for their views. 
And for 1.4 is the employment satisfaction with graduates. And you can see that it's about the employer's view. It's not conducted within the university, rather than the government would um, commission a, a, um, a research firm to solicit views from employers in Hong Kong. So it will be a, around a three year, four year cycle. So it's not the same as the, the first three ones. Let me tell you how it is measured about student satisfaction. So basically, um, I, there are a set of questions lining up and this is the most important um, item we have to report, um, which is about how well, uh, overall, how, uh, uh, how well you are satisfied with the quality of the program and your experience and, and things like that. So ranging from very unsatisfied to very un dissatisfied. For the student on learning, overall, I am satisfied with the quality of the overall learning environment taking account of the learning resources such as library, IT access, and opportunities afforded to engage with other students. So you can see that it's not just about classroom learning, but also about the facilities um, made available to them. And the key word is about student engagement. And this is the portfolio that I'm, I have to, to do it um, uh, every year. And then we look at the employment success rate. So we look at how many students were able to end up with employment or um, how many of them are going to do full-time studies afterwards. So we have to um, have two teams every year to collect these sort of um, surveys. And for the um, employment satisfaction graduates, so you can see that they look at uh, various aspects. They ask um, the employers whether the graduates from that university will be able to have that sort of interpersonal skills, management skills, technical knowledge, etc. So it's going beyond just about technical knowledge. It's about work attitude, interpersonal skills, and things like that. Okay, so I hope by now you have some ideas. And let me go to the final part, which is the student satisfaction in CTU. And in City University, how do we conduct this for, and we have to report that to the university. In fact, um, the, the set of questions will be the same among eight universities. And uh, you can see that we have to do it. And this is, uh, the response rate should be achieved around 80%. So about 80% of our graduates have to complete this. So it's a lot of work um, for that. And, but of course, for, and um, in addition to the formal learning experience, we have other core um, mechanisms. And I don't have time to go through that with you because for uh, staff, um, it will be, there will be a peer review of teaching, especially for the junior staff and the newly recruited ones. And also we have a lot of continuous um, assessment um, um, learning survey for each course for them and um, they are in the, uh, they are anomalously um, uh, uh, self administered uh, um, anomalously so and uh, which is give enough feedback for our staff members and uh, also you can see that um, uh, um, apart from the survey st staff the, a lot of um, mechanisms are used to collect views in relation to the outcomes experiences Lately, we have for each program, we have student staff committee meeting. In fact, we have to do it once for every semester, usually halfway through of the semester, because we want to know whether the semester is getting all right or not. And we get a lot of views and see whether we can relate the message to staff uh, so that they can make changes in the delivery of the course during that term. So, um, there are a number of um, mechanisms. And I think I, the, uh, this is part of the work for my team, which is the career and leadership team. And we have to conduct the graduate employment survey. So again, um, the, um, um, and uh, subsequent to getting all these uh, results, we will um, give feedback to each faculty so that they get to know whether their students are able to land um, with some jobs and what are the mean salary 
uh, the average salary for the uh, um, after graduation and things like that. And here are some, you can see that um, because uh, for the formal learning experience, as I've mentioned to you, it was not part of my job, but um, it was the provost's office. And I want to make sure that not only that we have the internal audit, but in fact, we have the external audit. And for each academic program, we have to appoint um, um, professors from overseas to be the exa external examiners. They read the exam transcripts, they read our course lines, and they have to produce a detailed uh, external examiners report every year. And each year, academic units will be asked to respond to the comments given by the external examiners. Okay, what about the co-curriculum? These are the some of the, I think I don't need to elaborate again, some of the sports, cultural activities, hostel life, etc. And these are some of the initiatives uh, from university. You can see that we are very busy. In fact, um, apart from, uh, even though we are not dealing with the curriculum, but we have to do a lot of like work attachment program, career fair, wellness of for all. We even provide them opportunities to learn yoga. So because health is so important and during COVID-19, we produce video um, uh, um, um, in order to, enable our students to um, deal with their physical fitness. And you may say that, wow, while you're doing all this, how can you conceptualize that? And I'm not going to bore with you, but I just want to mention to you, we forgot the CRESTA program here. So this is a, I think in Hong Kong probably, we are the university who are so advanced because my former boss is a, a, a expert in computer science. So he knows how to make good use of the information technology to record, but also to help record our student development activities. And this is the example I can show it to you. For each um, degree program, let's say if I'm the a program leader of a computer science, we have some sort of ideal attendance hours. So we measure by hours, how many hours we would like you to look at to join programs with the, to focus on your intellectual development. So for this case, they want 20. Um, how many hours we will expect our students throughout the four year of studies to join something in relation to internationalization? Obviously this one is 40 hours and these students, the actual attendance is only 24. That means he has a long way to go before graduation. And students can log into their account and they from year one, and they will be able to know whether they are able to achieve the ideal. And the yellow a bit here, uh, sorry, the green uh, shaded area here is the ideal attendance hours. Where's the line here? The dot line here is the actual attendance. So for these students, you can see that in the social development, look at the social skills, he attended more than expected. So on this side, this is about the graduate attributes. So we link our student development activities with our graduate attributes. Likewise, for our outcomes, graduate outcomes, again, ideal and actual. So students were able to know, we did not coerce them to fulfill all the ideal hours, but we want to set a milestone. And this milestone is set in day one, in year one, while they can. So, and uh, in our academic advising session between professors, they are asked to look at these with them apart from the course grades, because students, of course, they pay attention to the course grades. But as the Dean of Students, we want our students to look at the experience outside classroom too. So it provides another alternative. Okay, so um, to cut this short, uh, we have a theoretical framework why we devote so much time on the student experience outside classroom. If the student plan very carefully about what sort of skill set, especially soft skills, we as organizers, we want to plan activities to address, you know, the competences. Of course, as the university, not only my office, but other offices, we have to monitor the attainment of the ideal 
graduate outcomes. Ultimately, we want to enhance their employability. So I hope you are now convinced how we are delivering within our university. Um, I know that time is running short. I just want to tell you for each program, we have a number of category, as you can see from here. We try to have a number of graduate attributes. So we want to make sure that our students will be able to join uh, maybe one or, or a few of these. And each program will articulate very well what are the graduate attributes we want our students to achieve by attending the co-curriculum activities. So, so that students will be able to know whether they, which program they would like to choose. And um, as always, um, I, I, I think I'll um, show you the last one. My office also have a team to look at the QA of the student activities. And in fact, I'm the, the one who is in charge with only three staff. And uh, we have to pick and choose a few student activities program every year for quality assurance. And um, because we believe that there's a feedback loop, and not only there is a QA for academic subjects, but they also an academic, uh, uh, sorry, a QA mechanism for the co-curriculum activities. And um, um, in the first place, I want to show you, you know, one of the um, CEP, we call Community Engagement Program. So the program aims at achieving the social aspect in our, um, in, in, uh, that relate to the graduate attribute including civic responsibility, engagement with the society, et cetera. And you can see that we are using a number of standardized measurement to see whether they are able to achieve the outcomes by asking the participants to complete the pretest and post-test questionnaire. And as you can see that we are using um, statistics measure to showcase you know, whether they have done well or not. And um, as you can see, uh, last but not the least, you know, um, from time to time, we as the um, as a dean of the students, we produce a lot of things in the social media to make sure that um, our students, participants, or our graduates are the best alum uh, ambassadors to share, you know, their experience to uh, to make sure that they pay attention to the experience outside classroom. All right, so probably I would um, stop here and uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'll pass it back to the moderator. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, uh, for your uh, excellent speech. And uh, now the floor is open uh, for questions. Uh, question can be uh, posed by raising the hands or also you can put it in the chat, chat box and we can see all the attendees, attendees together. So you can raise your hand or you can put the questions on the chat box. So uh, while we are hearing from our uh, distinguished um, audience uh, about this uh, brilliant lecture, um, can I uh, ask uh, one question to Professor Chui uh, about uh, uh, your uh, very interesting topic? Professor Chui, can you hear us? Yes, can you repeat again? Yes, uh, uh, we uh, just I want to know one thing that uh, now uh, you we talk about the blended learning and we also uh, know from you about the participation of the students in the classroom. Uh, or in the lecture so that uh, we can transform uh, a student uh, to a best professional with best outcomes and experience that you rightly mentioned in, in your presentation. But, okay, uh, so, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Chef. Oh. Before I, I respond first, I want to, uh, you mentioned about the term blended learning, right? Yeah. Are you referring to the online and offline uh, learning? Yes, yes. Okay. So, uh, so in the online education, Actually, online education is not a new one. Um, in the last past polio pandemics in 1937, we also had remote learning using radios. Uh, it had in the it occurred in Chicago and other other cities yeah. that had the radio access. 
for the yeah. children. And in the 2019, we are having it in the online. So um, uh, in the current challenges that we are having in Bangladesh about the participation of the students in our classes, uh, in the online education, or okay. uh, we are also thinking that after the pandemic, uh, we may shift to the blended learning because it also has some further advantages. Okay. So uh, what do you think um, about uh, all those opportunities in the, and use of modern tools in the learning where we can ensure the participation uh, of the student so that the major transformation uh, that you are talking about, uh, we can uh, uh, ensure to happen. Okay, thanks for, for that. And uh, the reason why I want to clarify with that because a blended learning, in fact, is applicable, not only in the lectures and tutorials. In fact, in for our student development activities, during the pandemic in Hong Kong, we also deliver the, um, the um, co-curriculum activities also through Zoom and also Teams. So uh, blended learning is not just about academic uh, subjects, but also from uh, the co-curriculum activity. We have never stopped because even for counseling, so we are using uh, technology um, to assist us. So let me um, first of all address to you. I think one of the burning issue is about whether uh, the online learning can replace the offline learning. Um, 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 so um, we have already used the uh, online learning for almost two years because um, I remember in January 2020, uh, our university has already started using Zoom right away because uh, pandemic was quite serious in Hong Kong um, at that point. And um, uh, we have encountered, you know, um, uh, um, to see the transformation about the student feedback because um, uh, we have collected a, a lot of feedback along the way. Uh, I remember uh, when we first started the online learning, completely online learning because of the pandemic. And um, the students complained a lot um, because um, they have never expected um, the, they have to use the um, uh, technology to learn and they feel that they are unable to do so. Uh, and also they feel that our oh, face-to-face is more, um, um, will be more conducive. But uh, amazingly, uh, it's almost, you know, a year and a half now. And uh, our observation is our undergraduate students, they love online learning. And our online learning has three criteria. And I think this is important. Number one, um, we have to promote participation in online learning. So the, uh, the, like, for example, today, the way that we are doing is quite lower participation because we have about 200 people. I, I think there is a hindrance uh, uh, in the lecture. So we would not expect um, to have a lot of interactions with a class like this, though they can put up their hand or they are more uh, able to put it on the, um, uh, in the chat box and things like that. But we have small classroom and we have to make sure they turn on the camera. And they, we want to assess them equally as what we have done in the classroom. And we look at their participation and we have interactive activities, but with a smaller class. So with a class of 20, usually we will expect them to participate more actively. And um, so that's what I, I'm saying that, um, first of all, students hate it, but now undergraduate students, or in fact, we want to move it back to real-time uh, real, real learning, uh, a face-to-face -face teaching in September. Quite a number of undergraduate students actually write to us and say that can they do it online instead, okay? And that's the reason why we use the blended learning, but it, takes up a lot of time for the staff. So number one, even if it is online, um, make sure that um, uh, there will be interaction and they love it. Um, they can do it and they can handle it very well. And, and uh, in fact, I have observed quite a few and they have to um, um, immediately even answer some questions. Uh, uh, they have, um, they try to write and do some collaborative teamwork in their own a separate a chat room and they love it. But I just want to draw your experience, uh, the, your attention that the postgraduate students, I'm not too sure whether you have got the master students, they, that means they're more mature. They seems don't like it, I don't know why. And they want more face-to-face -face teaching. 
So that's the reason why right now we have to cater the learning needs of different style. And for the undergraduate students, probably we will continue on the blended learning. So some people can go to the classroom, but at the same time, you know, some people can choose for online learning. So, but it demands a lot from the professors. In fact, the professors experience, they just say that they can't handle both the camera as well as the non-verbal, the behavior within the classroom. Okay. okay. And and um, and and, uh, and secondly, uh, but for our learning experience survey, we didn't see a lot of difference between the the way how satisfied they are. In fact, if you deliver your blended learning mode nicely, they are as good as the face to face teaching, as shown in our survey. Okay. And. Um... We, the teachers, are also interested or want to have a good, credible assessment. So you mentioned in your class in that the optimum classroom size for the online education in your experience in your country is about 20. But uh, how do you think about the online um, assessment tools or optimum size of online assessment methods? Okay, let me clarify with you. In fact, the um, the uh, the class size, you know, range from uh, twenty to two hundred or even three hundred. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm saying that you know for the the expectation or the the course design, uh, if it is a very large class, then don't expect a lot of um, um, interaction because I have to say that you hear uh, some dishes, you know, that even the cats, uh, the dogs barking. Uh, at the background. So we will expect people to turn off the mic. So it is difficult to promote interaction. But for, um, if you really want to promote group interaction online, make it as a class size of 20, which is uh, the optimal one. And for the group exercise, I think it's normal. We, uh, we have group activities, we have group assignments, group tutorial, uh, um, and uh, through the, uh, the platform, you can have different rooms for them for group discussion. And we, we allocate 20 minutes and come back again, you know, in 20 minutes and, and things like that. And the students are doing fine with that. And uh, we, haven't, uh, um, we haven't changed a lot of, in terms of our assessment, but we, um, we do change a lot of our face-to-face -face exam to more coursework type of uh, take-home exam because uh, we try to ask them to turn on cameras, have three cameras, one at the back, uh, one on the top and uh, there are technical issues. Some students can't afford three cameras. In the end, we move uh, all the examinations to a uh, continuous assessment instead. Okay, thank you so much. I think that we are just on time and it's 3 p.m. in Bangladesh. Um, I think uh, our next uh, session will be coming up. If there is any more couple of questions, we can accommodate or we can uh, be with you in the other offline media. Uh, so power to, for communication. So uh, shall I uh, uh, give the floor to Dr. Basanta Barman uh, to roll it further? Okay. Thank you. Thanks to Professor Eric and Professor Saiful Amin for a um, comprehensive presentation and a very interactive follow-up session. Thank you so much.